Good morning and welcome to lecture number 13. <coughs> the last class we discussed segmentation and the use of segmentation <coughs> from a compiler's perspective uh, and also from the operating system perspective. We did discuss how segmentation helps the compiler to compile a program assuming that the first instruction of the code, the first weight of the data, where the stack starts, all could be assumed as 0 and you can do a compilation and then the code can be loaded anywhere in the memory and the program will execute correctly. Similarly, from the operating system point of view, when it wants to allocate memory, sometimes it had to do garbage collection and also the operating system has to switch from one task to another and when such a task switch happens, it is not necessary that they have to entirely take out the process from the memory and load the new context, but you can just do by adjusting the segment registers a task switch can also happen. So, these two are very important aspects wherein segmentation helps the operating system and the compiler. So, the next uh, step that we will be taking is to understand why, how segmentation helps in what we call as inter process and intra process protection. So, I will give you a very brief idea of how this happens taking the Intel and the AMD architecture as an example as a case study. First we will go and define what is intra process protection, what is inter process protection and then we will go ahead and describe how this is achieved by the hardware. What are the features in the hardware that will help one to achieve these two purposes which is desired and needed by the operating system. What do we mean by intra process protection? Suppose I have something like 1000 bytes of code, say to be a little precise, say 1212 bytes of code. I should only be executing within this 1212 bytes. If we cross this 1200 and 12 bytes. For example, if there is a jump instruction which jumps outside this segment, then it is wrong. The program cannot go and execute an instruction that is not part of its compiled code unless there is some authorization from the operating system. So, if such a thing happens, then the hardware should catch stating that you are the program is trying to do something out from the what is what it is supposed to execute. So, this in many times when you compile a program and do you do something wrong, but you execute it, you may get something called a seg segmentation fault. Sometimes it is also called sick fault. This is one example of a sick fault. So, what happens here? You have loaded a code which is 1212 bytes, but you are trying to access a code which is outside this boundary, either above this or below this. So, <coughs> now imagine there is a CPU which is executing this program with 
what should happen when your program tries and do something like this which it is not supposed to do immediately this wrong action should be caught who will catch this the operating system has to catch it but the operating system is also a software and it is in the memory somewhere in the memory so let us say this is the memory so the os is in the memory it is not executing so it is not possible for the os to catch such a wrong behavior because it is also a software for it to do some action it has to execute but it is not executing because in the cpu your process which is going to do this action is executing so it is the responsibility of the hardware to find out that such a problem has happened right so and when such a problem happens immediately the hardware should go and stop this process and start executing the os so that and tell the os such a problem has happened and so you are now starting to execute then the os can take some remedial action so this is how you get a protection from doing wrong activity right so when you define a segment in yesterday's class in the last class we said that there is a base address that is stored in a segment register along with this base address we also store something called the limit this limit is nothing but the size of the segment which the program can access if you cross this limit immediately the hardware will catch and it will stop the process and it will transfer control to an operating system routine which will come and handle we call this as an intra process protection because it is about a process trying to do something wrong and you stop that process from doing that mistake and you load it right <clears throat> now let us go and look at the next stuff <clears throat> similarly if i have a data segment for which you have allocated say some 516 bytes if you try and access anything above this 516 bytes the same segmentation fault will come so the data segment register now we talked about code segment similarly we can talk about the data segment so if the data that you are trying to access so let this be say 100 be the base so in your register in your segment register 100 the base will be stored and the limit 516 will be stored so you are supposed to access between 100 and 616 and if you just cross this boundary then immediately a segmentation fault will be detected by the hardware that's why we are talking about this in a computer organization architecture course it will be detected by the hardware and the transfer will be controlled to the uh, sent, sent to the operating system which will handle this so this is called intra process protection again i repeat because it is something with respect to a process and some protection that i want to do within a process within a process i don't want an instruction which it is not supposed to do i don't want the process to execute to access a data which it is not supposed to access so this is the this is how the segmentation and this is now possible because of segmentation because i define a segment and i associate a base and i also associate a limit with it why 
is this intra process protection very important? Again, we are looking at a multitasking system. We are not looking at a system which will only execute one process at a time. We are looking at a system where several processes are ready to be executed at a time and the operating system does something like a round robin scheduling which we explained in the previous lecture. One by one it gives some time and pulls it out. <coughs> Isolated and it should be handled. A error done by one process should not percolate and kill the other process. If somebody in, an, in, a, in a system which is serving say 1000 tasks, if one of the tasks does something erroneous that should not affect the execution, the correct execution of the remaining 999 tasks. So, it is very important that we isolate the error done by a task from others and that in that context the intra process protection becomes very, very important. Now, let us go and look at the next thing that we would like to discuss namely inter process protection. The inter process protection is defined as follows, I as process A should not access should not be given access to the code of process B. I as process A should not access the data of process B. I as process A should not have access to the stack of process B. Similarly, process B cannot access any of my code, data or stack segment. So, this needs to be ensured. Why is this necessary? Because <clears throat> from a security angle also, it is not correct for allowing any process to see or execute or read or write into the data or code segment of another process. So, I would like to protect or isolate one process from another so that whatever access, whatever data, whatever code process A acts that will not be seen or that is not accessible to the code or data of process B and this is precisely what we would like to achieve in this whole stuff. Okay. Now, and since I am talking about two processes and trying to protect one from another or isolate one from another, that is why the term inter process protection. Now, let us go and talk about how the <coughs> architecture or the organization of the basic CPU, what are the facilities the CPU architecture provides so that this intra inter process protection is enabled. Now, we will discuss a little more about operating system. As you know the computer organization and architecture course in any good computer science curriculum should be followed by an operating system course and this particular course is expected to motivate you to go and study many more things in operating systems. So, we have to talk lot about operating systems so that when you go to the OS class, you, you know what should be done at that point of time, what is to be learned, what is supposed to be learned in that course. And as I told you even in the first class that all that we are going to study are or all the features that are going to be inside a CPU or because either the compiler wanted it or the operating system wanted it. So, we will now see many, many things about operating systems, it, the needs of operating system and how it is satisfied by the underlying architecture. That makes the study of uh, computer architecture and organization complete. Right? So, now from an inter process protection angle, what is it that the computer hardware provides you as a mechanism? Now, let us go into a little more into the history of operating systems. When you look at op the traditional operating systems like the Linux, there is a kernel. I will call this as level 0. On top of it, 
there are some system programs you can on top of it there are some application development environment and on top of it is the application software i could view a traditional operating system like linux as four levels the level 0 is the kernel the level 1 i call it l1 is the system program like your compilers your assemblers your loaders linkers device drivers all these things come under the system programs on top of it are the application development environment probably you can push compilers also to application development environment so these are the compilers plus your desktop your terminal and all those things and then the software you write and execute that comes under level 3 so this type of an operating system which is a most sensible way of building any operating system is called a layered approach to the building of operating system wherein the entire operating system the software is classified into or is mapped down to one of these levels the level 0 is the most powerful level it has all the privileges it has access to every hardware right while the level 1 has a little less privilege than level 0 it cannot access all that the level 0 can do the level 2 has lesser privilege than level 0 and level 1 level 3 has the least privilege so this is how an operating system is built now let us look at how this concept of a layered operating system why do we need this layering otherwise an application program can go and access any of the kernel data and go and cause havoc to the system so i need to protect the kernel data from any application software one such important thing that we need to protect in any a uh, multitasking operate multi user operating system would be the password for example so we have several such resources like the password etc which we need to protect which we do not want every process to know or every process should know what it needs to know so this is the layered approach to operating system and how this layering is enabled what are the support the underlying hardware is going to give to enable this level uh, this layered approach now this is how this layering is enabled i want you to carefully understand every step i am going to talk of here so when the operating system comes up in the memory it will set up something called a descriptor table or what you call as a segment descriptor table it will some it will set up something called a segment descriptor table wherein it will load the base and limit of all the segments so if there are say two processes right let me say there are two processes it will load the code of zero the data of zero and the stack of zero the code of one the data of one and the stack of one it will just go and load the base address and the limit of the code segment which 
the process 0 has to do, process 0 has to use and it will also load the base and limit of the data segment which the process 0 has to use, store the base and limit of the stack segment which the process 0 has to use. Similarly, for process 1, the base and limit of the code segment of process 1, the base and limit of the code data segment of process 1 and the base and limit of the stack segment of process 1. Now, when process 0 is executing, so in the underlying hardware there is only one code segment register, one data segment register and one stack segment register. When process 0 is executing, this will be loaded into this, this will be loaded here and this will be loaded. When process 1 is executing, this will be loaded, this will be removed and this will be loaded. Similarly, D1 into DS and this will. So, when I move from process 0 to process 1, I have to up update the CS, DS, SS from Z, C0, D0, S0 to C1, D1 and S1. And when I move back from process 1 to process 0, I will be loading C1. Uh, C0, D0, S0 on top of C1, D1 and S1, right. So, the OS will set up a segment descriptor table because this describes the segment, right. It, what is, what do you mean by describing a segment? What is the, what are the attributes of the segment? Where it starts and what is the size, right. So, the OS will, will have this descriptor table and from this descriptor table, it will be it will go and load the segment registers corresponding to the task that is executed. And similarly, when the task switches that you go from 0 to 1, then the corresponding code data and segment base and limit will be loaded and the pre erasing the previous one. So, it is a very, very simple mechanism by which you know you go from one task to another. Now, let us assume that your process 0 is executing say at level 1, while well, a process 1 is executing at level 3. Your process 1 is not supposed to go and access process 0's data, stack and code. Note that this base and limit values are such that nothing overlaps. For example, if this is the memory, this is the entire RAM, your C0, D0, let me say C0, D0, S0, C1, S1, D1. So, none of this overlaps. None of these segments overlap. Now, I want to basically ensure that your P1 does not access the code or data or stack. So, let us say if P1 wants to access code or data or stack of P0, how can it access? If it is going, it has to go and load, suppose P1 wants to access D0, please note that it has to go and load this base and limit into this DS. If it is not going to load this base and limit, if it is, go, it is going to load some other base and limit, then it cannot access D0 because moment it is say for example, it is loading D1, from D1 it cannot go and access D0 because the moment it crosses that limit, the hardware will catch. There is an intra process protection that I described just before. If I go, if I have D1 loaded here for P1, this cannot go and access anything other than this D1 for data because the moment it crosses that limit, immediately the hardware will catch and say there is a segmentation fault or seg fault, correct. So, <clears throat> if I thought I want to low, if I want as P1, if I want to access the D0, belonging to P0, I have to load this base and limit into my DS. This base and limit has to be loaded 
into this ds so that p1 p1 can access p0 so what we do is and so we have to prevent that so what we do here is as follows it's a very simple fix we just add a privilege level here what is the the privilege level essentially says that what is the privilege what is the level in which the process is executing so for this we will put it as 0 0 so i have four privilege level 0 1 2 3 so i need two bits to represent this privilege level so i'll put 0 0 for c 0 0 0 0 0 and this would be or it is in l1 so i'll put 0 1 0 1 and i'll put 1 1 1 1 1 1 for this because p1 is actually executing in level 3 so i am going to put it as 1 1 1 1 1 now when a privilege 3 process tries tries to load a privilege 1 data then immediately there will be a segmentation violation and the hardware will detect it so if a privilege k process tries to load into segment register a privilege or descriptor such that k is greater than r a privilege k process tries to load into segment register a privilege r descriptor such that k is greater than r then there is a violation so here what is happening a privilege 3 code k is 3 process tries to load into segment register a privilege 1 descriptor and note that 3 is greater than 1 so immediately a violation can happen so this is another way by which a process running at an application level cannot go and touch the data or the code or the segment of a process running at a level below for example it cannot go and touch the data code or stack of a level 0 process or a level 1 or a level 2 if you are at level 3 you cannot have access to any one of this if you are at a level 2 you don't have access to these two level 1 you can't access level 0 so this is how an amount of intra process protection is basically enabled by your segmentation so using segmentation we basically get two major advantages the one thing is as we discussed yesterday so both the os and compiler can enjoy the benefit of having position independent code which it can move anywhere in the memory after it is compiled and even during at the time of ex, uh, execution so that and does not and will not affect the correctness of the execution and today we have seen two more advantages of this wherein the uh, the <coughs> inter and intra process protection is enabled by segmentation so this is one important aspect of memory management that is basically uh, <coughs> a part of your computer organization architecture course
So the next thing that I will be discussing is virtual memory. I will just basically introduce the notion of virtual memory today. And we will continue that in the next class uh, in detail. Now, what is virtual memory? Now, we present to the user a 32 bit architecture. Essentially, you tell the user that a 32 bit address space is available for you to execute. That means, you tell the user that you have 4 gigabytes of memory. And the, and the user can indeed write programs that can occupy this 4 gigabyte of memory. So, logically the user sees a 4 gigabyte of memory. So, I can call this as a logical address space. I call this as a logical address space because I as a user see 4 gigabytes of memory. But in the underlying hardware, there can be only 1 gigabyte of memory. In real, in real hardware, when you check the system, you will have only 1 gigabyte of memory. What do you say? Actual memory or physically available memory. So, this is what we call as a physical address space. The 32 bit extra, uh, 32 bit architectures were introduced in the market say at around late 80s or early 90s. At that point of time, the amount of memory that could be loaded on a motherboard will not be 4 GB. But in principle, they were able to actually in theory, in by logically, since I have a 32 bit address space, since I could address memory using 32 bit registers, using 32 bit displacements, I as a user can write programs which can address the entire address space of 32 bit. I can write programs which are as large as 4 gigabytes. But internally, but, but internally you will not have this 4 gigabytes. In the real system, you had only say 1 gigabyte. Now, how does a 4 gigabyte program execute on a 1 gigabyte physical memory? How does a the program which has logically 4 gigabytes in size, which assumes that the uh, entire memory is 4 gigabytes, finally executes on a 1 gigabyte uh, RAM. So, this is the notion of virtual memory. Now, what does the operating system do? It actually presents to the user, say, hey, you have 4 gigabyte, but then and allows the user to operate as if there was 4 gigabyte, but internally it somehow managed it with 1 gigabyte. So, the operating system was telling the user that it had 4 gigabyte of memory which it did not have. In, 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 in practice, it, in real, real world it did not have that. So, essentially the operating system is presenting to the user something virtual and that is why this memory is called virtual memory. So, there is 4 gigabyte of memory given to the uh, user and I want to execute it using just 1 gigabyte of actual memory. How this is possible? Let me stop this class with one very interesting or important point that we need to know. Suppose I am executing a 4 gigabyte program, is it necessary for me to load the entire 4 gigabyte into RAM and execute? 
it is not necessary. If I have a 4 gigabyte program, it is enough if I load always if I ensure this particular property that the next inst always at any point of time the next instruction to be executed and the data required by the next instruction should be there or should be available in the random access memory or in the physical random access memory. So, even if I have a 4 gigabyte RAM, please note that at any point of time, you know, even if I have a program that is as large as 4 gigabytes, please note that at any point of time, the next instruction to be executed and the data required by the next instruction that is going to execute, if these alone are there in the memory in the physical RAM and that is true for the entire execution time of this program, if this is there, then basically my program can eventually go to completion. It is when I want to execute a large program, I repeat it is not necessary for me to load the entire program into the memory, into the physical memory. It is enough if at any point of time I ensure this particular property is satisfied. The property again I repeat, the next instruction that I need to execute and the data that is required by the next instruction, if it is available at the RAM, at any point of time during my execution of a program, my program will eventually go to completion. So, this particular statement implies that I need not load the entire program, but I can load parts of the program, throw it off and load another part of the program. So, if I have only 1 GB memory, but I have a 4 GB actual uh, code, I load the first 1 GB, execute throw it off and put the second 1 GB, execute and then replace it by the third NGB and then the fourth 1 GB. I need not even go till 1 GB, I can even manage with say some KBs because I just need this particular property to be ensured. So, that forms the motivation for the support of virtual memory and what we need to understand in the computer organization and architecture course is what are the facilities that the hardware will provide for the operating system to enable this feature namely virtual memory. We will discuss about those features the whatever the hardware enables in our lecture number 14 which will happen uh, on uh, Wednesday, okay? Wednesday next. I will now open for uh, questions. If there are questions, please you can ask. I would like to know if you have done the assignments. There were, yes. Yes? Hello? 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 Yes? Yes? Sir, is there anything 
virtual memory is, is anything to do with the secondary memory also yeah virtual memory has some has something to do with the secondary memory because we have to keep this 4 gb of program somewhere and from there only we have to load into the primary memory and then throw it back so a virtual memory concept is implemented using the help of the secondary memory and the primary memory along with some support features from the hardware so the virtual memory as i will describe in the next class has something to do with the secondary memory also thank you sir yes any other questions if there are questions please raise your hand i would like to know if you have done the assignments there were five assignments that were circulated may i know how many have been completed by your students yes how the production is enabled in inter process sorry how the production how the? is enabled in inter process how the production is enabled in the inter process how the production is enabled as i explained to you in the previous uh, thing there is a privilege level associated with each segment so so if i am process zero i if i am a process working at pl0 that is privilege level 0 all my memory segments are designated as pl0 segments and when we execute a process at privilege level 3 those segments would be 1 or uh, 3 uh, those those segments will have a privilege level 3 now when the process 1 which is at privilege level 3 wants to execute or wants to access data with a, on a privilege level 0 code or privilege level 0 segment it has to as i explained to you it has to go and load the segment descriptor from the table so it has to see that your data segment suppose i am a privilege level 3 code and i want to access privilege level 0 data and segment data data so i have to load the base and limit of that segment which so stores that privilege level 0 data into my data segment register and if i try to load it then what happens the hardware stops me from doing that because i am a privilege level 3 code and i am trying to load the base and limit of a data that is privilege 0 and if i am a privilege 3 code and i am trying to load that privilege level 0 code and data the operating system stops me from the, the hardware stops me from doing it so i am not i will not be in a position as a privilege level 3 code to even load my segmentation register with the base and limit of a privilege level 0 data so i cannot access any of the privilege level 0 data so as a process at privilege level 3 i cannot go and access data code or stack of another process which is at privilege level 0 so i now give you an isolation between a privilege level 3 code and a privilege level 0 code and this is how i am ensuring inter process protection which particular part in the hardware does this work ah uh, which particular part Hello? in the hardware does this work the part in the hardware which does this work is segmentation that is why we are discussing this as a part of segmentation so there is a hardware 
that is that is responsible for loading the segment register with the base and limit of the segments so when a process at privilege level 3 is working then you try through an instruction to load the base and limit of your segment register uh, with some base and limit from the segment descriptors so there are several descriptors that are available in the descriptor table and you try and load one descriptor which has a privilege level less than the current pri uh, privilege level and the moment you try and load it the hardware responsible for loading the segment registers will check it it will check the, the several checks that fellow does number one is he checks that you are go going outside the limit if you are going outside the limit then it gives you a seg fault as i explained to you earlier similarly when you are trying to load even at the time of loading if i am a privilege level 3 code and i am trying to load a privilege level 0 segment then immediately it will raise an uh, exception or an interrupt it will stop the program from executing and transfer control to the operating system saying this guy is trying to do something which it's not supposed to do so the hardware that is responsible for segmentation is one that will go and do this particular uh, inter inter process protection is it okay any other questions and the assignment added i'll just get back the q triple e will get back to you regarding the assignment there are five assignments that needs to be done and let me just talk with the q triple e coordinators at iit chennai and uh, see what has happened to it okay so but uh, please do complete those five assignments then only you'll get a grip over what i have thought okay but i'll ensure those assignments reach you very shortly thank you